this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work again. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. So the pandemic has clearly affected the value of businesses big and small. But there's a way you can recapture a lot of that value if you think about your business through the lens of what an acquirer will care about. You know, as we grow our companies, oftentimes they become this sort of spaghetti ball of different products and services, but acquirers only care about what they could not replicate, what it would be difficult for them to redo or rebuild. And therefore, they're going to place a high priority on the products and services that you sell, which they deem to be truly differentiated. And that's why looking at your business through the lens of an acquirer can really be helpful in these situations where you're trying to rebuild. We can help you do it. Just go to valuebuilder.com. You can take a questionnaire that will help you look at your business through the lens of an acquirer. We can also connect with you with one of our certified value builders who can be a sounding board for you as you go through this process. Best of luck with the rebuild, the restart. Please go to valuebuilder.com to check out the resources there. Hey, this is a fun episode with a guy named Josh Davis who built a company up to $10 million in annual revenue when he decided to put it on the auction block. He got 400 different companies interested in buying his business. Ultimately, when the audience down to two finalists chose one and entered into a due diligence process, weeks away from selling, he decided to pull the plug. To tell you why, here is Josh Davis. Josh Davis, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Thank you, John. Nice to be here. So I was doing the reading about your company, and it's like <clears throat> women's health, marketing, and hospitals. I'm like, oh my gosh, I have no clue what this dude does. So give it to me straight. What is, what, what is women's health marketing? I, I need to understand what you guys did. Now kind of think about like weight, lo- weight Watcher support groups with like American Heart Association walks. Uh, with hospital magazines and just the community building and marketing of hospitals to the community. And we helped hospitals do that towards women specifically. Women make up basically 75% of the hospital revenue. So, Wow. So, okay. So if I'm a, if I'm a hospital, I want to attract women and make sure women in my community are healthy. I could subscribe to your service and, and you would provide articles, uh, other sorts of uh, activities for women in, in my community that would promote health and healthy living. Yeah, I mean, for, it kind of right. But with our exit in 15, it was mostly 80% digital. When the company started in 2000, digital hardly existed. So it really was always a content marketing business, but evolved from more like traditional billboards, ads, and magazines to all digital content over the, the years we, 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 we worked on it. It's so funny because I, I live in Canada where we have socialized medicine, right? So like the idea of like a hospital being a for-profit entity is so foreign to me. So you got to help me through this. So, so hospitals would buy, like the customer's the hospital, right? Customer's the hospital. Okay. And they're buying it because they want more sick people? No, that can't be the case. Because <laughs> what, like, why are they, why are they, what's the profit motive, I guess, for the hospital? Start, start put a scale on the U.S. hospital, just the U.S. hospital market. It's around 6,000 hospitals. And the average revenue is 100 million plus per hospital. So it's a gigantic wow. market. So the marketing budget's three, $4 million out of a huge budget. They're spending something on radio print, uh, just build, maybe it's made for the foundation to raise money, whatever they, they put it off as. There's a marketing budget. And we fit into, I guess, like a relational marketing, pair to pair, you know, non traditional, um, you know, clubs and, and, you know, community building. Uh, but around this massive industry of hospital marketing departments. And then there's- I had no idea it was so big. It's amazing. So, so what would a hospital pay to subscribe? What would they pay? You know, we were, one of, one of our um, really good um, um, successes as a business was our contract and the way we thought about billing these hospitals to be clients. And they were on three-year contracts. So we had them on a 36-month contract in which, the, in which the annual revenue, you know, ranged from 50 to 75 to 80 per, per hospital per year. $50,000? 
uh, sixty seventy thousand dollars per per house. Got it. Okay. That's uh, yep. So under a hundred thousand, but then you'd have additional services. You know, service for for heart heart disease or cardiovascular. You know, that would be an add on price. So it's kind of a base price uh, for these hospitals to have exclusive license to the content, which is by a media market. So you'd only own it in Nashville, Tennessee. You'd only own it in Northern Chicago. So um, it was regional in nature um, because hospitals don't really compete more than a few hundred miles from each other. How do you define a media market? Because it's such an interesting with an exclusivity contract because markets tend to sort of merge into one another. How did you guys sort of put hard lines in the sand and try to, to claim a media market? You know, I guess it shows how long I've been in the media industry so far. Because when I got into it, after, you know, after school and like around 2000, um, you know, there were, it was called DMAs, which were designated market areas. And then there were also MSAs, which were um, also media service markets, mostly for radio and TV and, and all the regional broadcasters. It was very well defined. And the hospital, So you just use their tables? That's the hospital. The hospitals are already buying media. They're already buying media. So they're, they're already into the system of how the media market works. As we evolved the business, we went, we went, we went strictly to a zip code basis. We say, okay, give us the four or five or seven zip codes w- around you. And if we don't think you're being honest around where 80% of your customers are from, 80% of your revenue, you can always audit. The U.S. publishes everything. So you can always audit the, um, the, 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 the local zip code and actually verify, you know, no, like you're, you think you have patients in that market, but only three or four percent. So we, we, Great. We, how, how did you get customers to to make a three year commitment? You know, contract value almost you know could be as more than two hundred thousand dollars. I would think that's a big decision. How did you get them to make a three year commitment? Um, it, it it went to a sales cycle. We had a sales cycle that was almost twelve to eighteen months. So the decision making process with the client group was really really long. And maybe the three-year contract versus one-year contract added on five or six months to the end of it, but it was still an incredibly long sales cycle where you, you know, you work in the hospitals for some cases six months, but some cases six years. It took that much time for the hospital buy in because once the hospital does something, um, it, it, it's kind of an organizational effort towards it. Uh, how so did, we you, were, comp- how we did were, you compensate salespeople to reflect the fact that it was such a long sales cycle? Very, very good question. Um, we would pay um, the commissions up front. So, you, so you're, you're signing a three-year contract, which is paying annually. The salesperson is making at this time of sale, you know, two years up front, another, another one 12 months later. And I think when we were really humming along, you're doing six or seven sales a year. So there, there's, a, there, there's all this recurring revenue for the salesperson 12 months later as well. So um, the, the harder part was finding the perfect person to sell the product. It wasn't like hiring someone to work at my sub shop or my um, insurance sales place. It was such a specialized niche around this hospitals, U.S. hospitals, and, and how they interact with the community. What did you learn about hiring salespeople over the years? Um, I learned I was really bad at it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I learned- did you ever get any better at it? Uh, I, I hope so. I, I, I hopefully What's the secret? Other people, I'm going to rely on other people to hire the salespeople and I'll just support them. <laughs> no, but seriously, what did you learn? Did you, did you, did you discover course, anything interesting about hiring great salespeople? Hiring or, or working with them? Um, uh, I was thinking in particular about hiring them. Uh, it really about hiring them, just how, how much in my experience in, in my space, you can over rely on sector knowledge. So, Within our space, you can work in, you know, pharmaceutical sales rep, a medical sales rep, a t- whatever it is. All those over overcompensate the fact that some sort of healthcare in their background, some sort of physician sale process in their background. In almost no cases did it ever translate to um, what we were doing, which is really marketing services. It wasn't selling a product. It was what selling. did you find to be a better uh, set of characteristics to look for? And salespeople, um, uh, you know, as I got more sophisticated, I liked the testing. So we, we were certainly doing, you know, really um, two or three sets of tests to look at. Is this a hunter? Is this a, um, you know, someone will develop relationships or hunt and making sure you have 
you know, truly hunters in positions that involve making, you know, six, seven, 10 cold calls in a day. And you just, you just kind of thrive off that or someone who's better at building relationships, um, which in, unless your company is very large, you, you're not really hiring people to build relationships. You're hiring people to sell. Um, which personality test did you find most predictive of success? Which one did you like the most? Um, I, I like the Enneagram. Um, the Enneagram has, 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 is one that I learned about more How recently. How do you spell it? Enneagram. I've never heard Enneagram. of that. Enneagram. It's E-N-N-E-G-R-A-M, I believe. I think okay. there are trainers definitely in your area who would be certified to come in and talk to you about that and understand how that works. That's not specifically for sales. That'd be more for organizational development, uh, but it has a sales, I mean, within that 11 person structure of who you are in the workplace, there's two or three that are sales and you don't fit within those two or threes. It's a good indicator as well. Um, you know, I found with salespeople, the thing I really had to work on as I grew the company over 15 years was understanding how to compensate them so that they're not being overpaid for the first sale and then they're decreasing their, um, their motivation to make additional sales. There's some sort of cliff you don't know about in which they, they make their 10 sales and they're kind of not motivated the following year. Um, so I, I found I was constantly, you know, spending on a salesperson, you know, maybe one day a quarter, maybe two, just thinking about compensation and how to motivate them. And every year I got, I think, better at it, but you, you can't control them as people. You still have people you're dealing with whose, whose lives you can't always control. What did you find in your case, again, speaking from your own experience, work the best in terms of comp? How did you structure it? Uh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I always felt great, but best as the employer with the lowest possible monthly draw, whether it was sure. 5000 or 15000 whatever it was, I, I'd like to get that as close to five or, you know, somewhere in that, you know, as low as possible. Uh, but clearly, you know, I've had some months where there was 20 grand a month just for a person in that space. So I, I like having a very low uh, base as much as you can. And I like having unlimited earning, earning potential. I mean, so if they make 15 sales and the goal was 10, you know, 15, 7, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, you know, they can make, you know, 80% mark. I mean, to just it, very generous on the back end because... You know, if I started a year with four salespeople, usually two were successful at the end of the year. I mean, you know, a couple other washout. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, and then also, um, I don't know, my experience, and I, I don't want to generalize, but we, we had very, we, we always, I always had a highly emotional sales team. And I, I don't know if that's typical, but in my case, they, they took a lot of emotional energy to simply kind of keep on track. And, and, and you know, that there, there was more, but maybe it was just because they were more valuable. So I had more connection to their, you know, life's dramas or whatever else is it's, going on. <laughs> I've heard that before, that the, the drama is, uh, is intense in the sales organization. Um, let's get into the actual uh, kind of leading up to 2013 when you decided to put the company on the market. And just give me the, the kind of broad strokes numbers at this point, sort of what's the revenue number of employees. I'd love to know what the contract renewal rate is, uh, just to give me a sense of what that, that churn rate is. I'm sure that was a kind of key stat in the, in the sales uh, book. Yeah. So, so um, we sold, um, so it was always based on, you know, first let me start, my dad was an entrepreneur. So I grew up around businesses and something I learned early on, I'm not sure it was on purpose, just kind of absorbed it was, you know, there's a good philosophy, which I subscribe to that you build a business to sell it. And that's really, it's the only purpose because unless you want to pass it down as a car dealership or generational, I never had a vision for this business not being sold. So when I started the business or got involved in 2000, I always thought when I could sell it, which, I understood was at $10 million of, of, of revenue. Um, that was kind of the goal. So as we fast forward to 2013, that was when we were uh, 2014, our forward projection was $10 million plus of revenue. What was magic about 10 million? Yeah, you know, just my understanding from private equity and from bankers that, you know, there's X number of companies looking to buy companies under 10 million. Once you go above 10 million, there's X you know, times 10 more private equity funds at that level. Once you're over 50 million, there's X times 15. 
So the, so the bigger you are, there's more buyers out there. But if you're selling a company at seven million dollars, you won't get in front of a lot of buyers because the buyers are only looking for deals that are showing ten million in revenue. Um, so for me, that was um, the first opportunity I'd have to sell at at, a, at at the kind of level or multiple I expected. So future was. You, what you expected in 14 was 10 million. What were you at in your last previous, like finished fiscal year or whatever? You know, we, we had a good little run there. So I think 2012. So remember, the, the sales process takes a couple of years. So in 20, yeah. when we hired the bankers, we, we didn't know our 13 numbers yet. So you're really, you're really selling off 12 and 13 and 14. Uh, so I think 12, we did you know, just under 9 million or so. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we were, you know, we were a typical, we would grow 15, 20%. We, we, we were stable business and we weren't growing 30% a year. So, it, it, you know, from it may, may, maybe, we were, maybe we were mid eights or wherever we were at our growth rate, 2014, you were clearly at 10 and change. Um, so in 2013, we, we, we started a process, I think 2013, we ended the year, you know, somewhere with nine and change. So somewhere on that path, which is all you need because we, we went to market um, we actually sent out our SIM, our confidential um, memorandum of the companies. It was like July of 14. And you know, you're talking about you know, literally a year and a half later. So we executed exactly as we had put out our little graphs. So we, you know, the bankers, one of these young bankers you meet and they, they do, you know, dozens of, dozens of these deals a year. Here's one of many deals they do. The fact we had this really, really, I mean, I, have an, I went to grad school, I have an MBA. We, we have one of those classic grad school graphs. The well, hockey stick. 13, 14, hockey stick. And <laughs> yeah. you know, like, oh my God, look at page 12 and 13. Like, like you know, it was, it was looking at the hockey stick graph. So we executed in 12, 13, and then 14 was the year we were selling off of, which, you know, the reason the timing was, was I, I knew in 12 we were, you know, with a recurring revenue model, you have a good sense of, you know, where you're going to head. head. Um, I, I, I kind of started thinking about it at that point and, and, you know, literally spent, you know, spent, spent, spent six months just interviewing bankers, just looking at how to look at hiring a banker. It was, it was a long, um, you know, kind of purposely planned process that, uh, you know, started and, and, you know, took, you know, 18 months or plus once, once you're the entire exit story. Um, what did you think the company might be worth in the, in the terms of a, a multiple of earnings? You know, I, I got, you know, so, so as I said, I, I, you know, I went to university and grad school in, 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 in the States and have an MBA. And I guess my education stuck with me for selling my first business because it's something I, I had learned. So the, in grad school, certainly a seven times multiple, I mean, if you look at industry averages across the last hundred years or whatever, 640, whatever it is, there's numbers which seven times multiples are hard to get, uh, but certainly attainable. It's, it's not a 15 or 20 or it's, it's not a, it's not a salesforce.com multiple or like a, but it, it's, it's a very, for market service business, it, it's a good kind of target. So I was focused on that. And, and, you know, as your, as your listeners know, sometimes earning means if, if you're making three, $4 million a year, 25, $30 million. And for your listeners who haven't sold companies, when you sell the company, you, you have ad backs, you have these ad backs you didn't realize were, you know, three, four hundred thousand dollars of, of expenses that aren't carrying forward. And you can get a seven times multiple on that. That's another, you know, four or five million dollars. So there, there's some um, seven times EBITDA is, is um, in my education, kind of a very appropriate multiple. And from the owner's standpoint, it's fair. It, it's not 20 times, you know, but it, it's a, it, it, it seems like a fair multiple. And in my, we didn't sell for quite seven. We were in that range. Um, you know, it, as you get to the four or five times, you're thinking as an owner, should I sell or not? You, you, the way you think about it, well, in three or four years, you're going to earn that money back just through just, just distribution. So, you know, I think emotionally that seven times level it makes sense that it's such a common multiple for a successful deal. Because as a seller and the buyer, I think it's a fair, have a fair place to be. In terms of ad backs, because that may be lingo that some people won't have heard of, can you describe? what the process of, of normalizing your profit and loss statement was and the ad backs in your case that, that didn't carry forward. Just you so know, people understand what an ad back is. Yeah. I mean, so typically when someone buys your company that they're buying all the assets and they're buying either all the employees, non the employees or, 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 you, or you as the owner, maybe staying on. 
Uh, but let's say you as the owner um, are not staying on and you have all these other costs that are going through the business, like you're you're having lunch every Friday at the country club and that becomes a business expense. And that could be 50 grand right there. And you could have... Um, Man, you have expensive lunches in Florida. Uh, this, this, this is some golfing life I saw in some movie. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> to be clear. Okay, got it. So these are expenses that aren't necessary that you might charge as business expenses they, they that may not. Non, uh, they're non-ongoing company expenses. So they'd be yeah. things like if if your Amex fee is five hundred bucks a year and the company's paying for Amex, you because you get free you, you get free to fly or clubs at clubs the airport. That five hundred bucks, but those add up in in a business and. Um, in our case, um, you know, I think in most cases, you, 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 you're trying to say that you're, you're, you're finding roles like, you know, our, our accountant's niece is on the payroll. She, she's really not a moving forward expense. Like she, she's, her, her job is ending. She's not a key expense because the seller is really clear is if that person's job is, is needed moving forward, we're paying you for that. We get to keep it moving forward. Um, and Got it. You, you end up having a lot of dialogues about those topics and. It, it, it opens up areas that are clearly ad backs. They're saying, hey, we don't value this part of your business. We're not going to pay for it. And you're like, okay, well, that's an ad back. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, there we just increased my value. So <laughs> you built, I mean, you, you mentioned it yourself. You grew up in an entrepreneurial family. You go to business school. I mean, you, you built this company to sell it. You had the 7X number in your mind. As you looked out in the, the kind of universe, who did you think had a strategic reason to buy the business? You know, strategic reason to buy the business, it was a very, very small pool or audience. I mean, there, you know, there, there are some publishers out there do these massive conferences and healthcare is one of their sectors and, you know, they, you know, or an advertising agency, a big hub boss or a publicist, you know, they would all be looking at us because we have agency function. Uh, they don't pay seven time multiples. So, so within our audience who would buy us, they, they would be a not a good buyer because you're not going to get what you want from them. They're going to view you differently at a lower, at a lower value. A better strategic for what we were um, would be someone who wanted to be in the pharmaceutical and also the health hospital marketing space. So we were being looked at by private equity mostly as a, as a vehicle to do a roll up around because we could then create a vertical for them of one vertical being hospital services. I already mentioned there are 6,000 hospitals in the U.S. and also pharmaceutical services, which is even a bigger sector. Um, so we were being looked at mostly by financial buyers who said, hey, these guys are you know, close to $10 million, uh, 80% is through hospitals, 20% is through pharma. Can we work with Josh and his team? And can they, can we buy other, can we, can we do other acquisitions, uh, you know, from this? We did talk to some strategic buyers, but um, our exit process, um, um, by my direction, we, we did more of a, of a wide auction. We, we had our bankers not just go to the top 100 private equity firms and the top 100 strategic buyers. We went to 600 private equity, well, maybe, maybe, it was, wow. maybe, it was, maybe it was 400. I, I think I exaggerated, but let's say 400. We, we, had, a, we, we had 400 to 500 in which we said we want to let them know about the company. It turns out the people we ended up talking to at the end during the final, you know, the, the final dance were all folks in the initial list. So it wasn't like anything we did um, added to the end, end buyer community, but it gives a sense to your listeners how broad the, the appetite is for any, well, I shouldn't say any, a, a successful business in, in a hot sector or good sector like U.S. healthcare uh, with a compelling model of recurring revenue. Um, you know, that there, there, there were just a huge audience that wants to see that. And 10 million, I think if we were at a $5 million company, it would have been half those people because so many would just said, hey, you know, we don't want to see this. The company's not big enough. So at 10 million, you've got this list of 400 or so potential acquires, many of which sounds like private equity. Um, how did you get, how did you think about the potential for that broad an auction becoming you know public information that you're planning to sell the company and and the impact that would have on your employees and, and potentially your customers yeah it's a, a good question so we, we we're we're in probably the one percent in which when we sold the company um, i told the employees up front 
before I started the process, what I was planning on doing. I, I communicated to them what that, why we're doing it, and why I think it's good for the company, our clients, and them. And so throughout the whole sales process, there was tremendous transparency and there was really almost a goodwill and, and umbaya around what we were planning on doing. The customers in some way, I think also, you know, had the same sort of feeling that, that this should be a bigger company and, and we had, you know, a bigger owner, it might be a, you know, better, better for us. So it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a secret. Um, I think the, from a legal standpoint, from a cost standpoint, and your listeners should, if you're going to sell a company, you know, ensure you, you're married to a lawyer or have a very good lawyer who's a friend, uh, because you, you can easily be caught up in some legal expenses related to decisions. That'd be a decision around that. It increase your legal costs by 20, 30 grand because it creates more work on, on their side as you get more replies. So it, it's all kind of a, a push and pull around it. But as you hear the whole story, that broad auction gave us a very good sense of, we, we did a broad auction versus narrow auction. So if the listeners know a narrow auction is your investment maker. So say, you know, hey, hey, hey John, uh, you know, these five guys are going to buy you. We're going to send it to 25 and you know, by, you know, August, we're going to have them having dinners and, and talking through it and we'll get a check in January. And then, you know, that's why I recommend you. That's a narrow auction. That, that's just the, the narrow 15, 30 people versus a broad auction where you can go to, if I was doing it today, I'd probably go to a thousand people. I'd probably expand the audience to Asia and the Middle East and Europe because my, our 400 are basically all domestic. So uh, broad auctions, broad and narrow auction be, you know, more investment banker, friends and family. What was your pitch to employees making the case that selling your company would benefit them? You know, we always had a very positive and good employee um, morale and kind of connection to the business. And that's because because our end product, we were b 2 b to c So we, we call ourselves business to business to consumer. We sent stuff to hospitals that they sent to consumers. B to B to the consumer. Um, the mission behind that was women's health. It was breast cancer. It was babies. It was moms. So our entire employee base on their first interview, first week of work, it went away after years. I mean, they loved the company, but it was still a job. We, we had people who believed in what we were doing, believed that Spirit of Women is, is a brand that they're proud to work for, and, and believed me in saying that my own vision really takes us to ten million dollars. And if you want to see this. You know, become a American Heart Association or some hybrid nonprofit, huge organization. I, 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 I need help. You know, so it was a very honest message that had a lot of truth in it, and and it worked out. I don't want to say it worked out better or worse the employees. I mean, the company's still around. They have very, they have many happy employees who've been there before the merger, after the. I mean, so I don't know what the end outcome was. We were able to tell them, which made my life easier because you're not always say, am I talking too loud? Did I send this email to the wrong person? Uh, so I think on a, probably a mental health standpoint, it was, it was better for, probably better for me and for the sales process, the actual buyers, the private equity firms at the end, they loved it. It made, made the company worth more money, that, that they're not worried about the employees all revolting. Um, yeah. so. it's, it's a fascinating uh, conundrum, of course, because uh, obviously some people worry about it getting out to their employees and so forth in in your well, case i think i think our, i mean i think our employee i think we always had an attitude with our employees we hired a lot of young people a lot of people just straight out of college a lot of folks came from nursing so we got we had a lot of flow from our hospitals to us so we got a lot of people who were nursing for four or five years who used to making no money having these incredibly hard challenging jobs and we gave them jobs which we always incentivized them they always make more money every year and they were young professionals. So it, it was it was a track to a young professional. Um, but it, it still is. I mean, it's an interesting track between hospitals and, and and agency work and and community health. And it's, it was a uh, very very interesting company. You said to me, uh, you know, your pitch was, "Look, I need help to get us to the next level. My vision is sure. ten. Blah blah." Did you intend to stay on post sale? Yeah, let me share. I've never shared with the employees. It was 10. The, the, that number was never okay. known. I mean, the, 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 their number was we had, we had 120 clients and they were working their asses off. They were so busy because we had so many hospitals they had to service. So it was a, the nice thing with the model is, is as you went from 40 clients to 80, 
it didn't take double the staff to service them. So you had this network of hospitals they were servicing and working with. So it was more around, you guys are so busy, we're gonna, you'll make more money, we'll have more incentives. It, it was more around, I pitched it to them around, you know, the, the, in our space, there's a, a publicly traded company called the Advisory Group. The Advisory Group, they're publicly traded US stock markets. You know, they're a $300 million company kind of in our space with employees making lots of money. It's very highbrow consulting work. So there was, there was some vision as to, do you guys want to work at this company in 10 years or do you want to be in the suburbs of, you know, Boca Raton, Florida? <laughs> you know? And, Got it. Got it. But I guess where I was going with that is... is and, and, and there was some salesmanship there. There was some salesmanship by me because it wasn't... Our talks around $10 million. That was never part of it. That was never... I think one of the funniest things I can share with you, we sat the companies out for a, a Friday one day for a team lunch building exercise and you know, probably some, some other team building exercise. And we let everyone, you know, we talked about the exit plan and what it meant as far as bankers visiting the office and buyers living in the office and being prepared for accountants and that whole thing. We, we let the team, and it was probably like 18, 20 people were there, ask questions. You know, what are your questions? And there were all sorts of questions. Like, we still have coffee here. Will you get rid of the water? It was weird questions. But <laughs> someone asked what EBITDA was, you know, EBITDA. And these are all, these are all young healthcare marketing people, and th th that's a weird term. And someone, no one knew. So some of the 20 people, no one who, was, who wasn't like, you know, kind of the senior finance In team. Finance, group. yeah. Um, and some, you know, nice little 28-year-old girl, Kelly, went up there and, and wrote out. It was so funny. I don't know what, I, can, I wish I remember what, what the words were, but it had nothing to do with finance. <laughs> like, it wasn't even, it was like, it was a market, it was something marketing. Like, it was awesome. <laughs> That's um, great. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I, if, I, I think I, I wouldn't start with the premise that telling your staff is always a very negative, is always a, a, always to say no to, because in many cases, you're only talking 25, 30 people. Um, you know, that was that was in my case was 25 30 people i think a lot of companies sell at that size they're people and if you you know that they, they all want what's best for you in some way as well so uh, it, it was a very human experience and it, it helped i think when we were selling the company then the buyers all all thought it made the company work more money so it would increase it definitely that that culture end of the company increased our value that's super helpful so let's get into the sale itself so so the Bankers promoted it to 400 plus uh, folks. Uh, what was the next step? I mean, did you get some interest? Did you get some letters of intent or what was? Yeah, you know, so, so remember, I'm, I'm the entrepreneur who started the sales process in March of 2013. I wrote a check to my banker only for like 50 grand. It was a small deposit on it, like in March of 14. And by July, you know, I'm ready to go to market. I mean, they should have the whole thing done. I mean, it should take 10 weeks or so. So March, April, May, June. July. So I'm already six months in and I'm, I'm freaking, you know, I'm ready to go. And, and they're like, well, we haven't heard anything back yet. And I'm like, like, what the fuck am I paying you guys for? Like <laughs> I'm sitting there, it's August. I mean, it, it's, I think I was in Florida and Colorado. It's hot. It's like, like, I was like, like do more, like put out more. Uh, but pretty much after that, um, September, I like most cycles and work. I mean, August is really quiet. July is very quiet. Unless you get your sim out, in February, but you know, things shut down in the summer. It's not as bad as Europe, I hear. I don't think it's as bad as being in, you know, Spain or Germany in August, but you know, things slow down. Um, so, you know, we got back from, you know, summer and the kids are back in school. And but in that case, I had no kids. I, I, I had a child a few months after that. Uh, but when you come back, there were, you know, we went from, you know, let's say it was 400 total. We probably got back 40, um, 40 requests for the SIM. Um, and then from, being a confidential information man around the kind of yeah, package. So it's, that, yep. it, it's like a three-step process. So, so the banker writes something, you approve all these things. They're all legally being read. You have a preview email. You have a mini SIM, which is like a three-page, really nice little PowerPoint, you know, PDF. And you have like a seven-page SIM, maybe. And you have like a full 30, 40-page, whatever the final deck would be. And each one of those tend to have a legal signature with it. So you're actually creating some confidentiality you know, there was a CDA with everything we did. So I mentioned legal costs. Everything you do, if it's 40 SIMs or... What does CDA stand for? Confidential, uh, confidential, um, memora uh, uh, confidential, uh, memorandum of confidentiality. 
Okay, like or like an NDA is that actually, like non disclosure yeah. agreement or something? Same, same, as that, same as an NDA, yes. Okay, got it. Okay, so everything's being signed up. So you're down to 40. Of the 40 Sims, you meet with some folks. How many of them actually sort of came to the table with a formal offer? Well, I think the best way they we went from 400 to 40. Of the 40, we didn't hear back from all of them. Like, like half the 40 were just jokes. So they just wanted it. They never saw it again. Maybe it was a competitor. It was kind of scary. It could be a competitor. You don't know what's going to happen to them. We sent out 40. We know who has them because it basically says in the document, you, you received this, you can't share it. We sent out 40. Of the 40, we ended up in talks with around 12. And what that means is they're saying, hey, banker, you know, we want to meet these guys. We, we want to meet Josh. We want to meet Josh's team. We want to fly to Boca. We want to, we, we're, we're ready to meet them. And of the 12, I think we met, I mean, this is pre-Zoom, but we, we, we definitely had like, you know, conference calls. There weren't video calls. Um, of the 12, we probably spoke with eight or nine of them. Um, mm -hmm. I probably spoke with closer to 25 or 30 during the entire course, but I probably spoke with eight or nine. We, we probably had six or seven in-persons, mostly in Florida, a couple in New York. Um, I use those as ways just to learn a lot because every time I met with one of these buyers, uh, whether it's a private equity firm or strategic buyer, they brought in really smart lawyers and bankers and really smart dudes, really smart guys who came in and we'd meet for three or four hours, um, you know, maybe two, three hours. It was, it was, it was a half day usually, maybe have dinner, but I'd learn a lot. I mean, they, they came in prepared. They came in with really good questions. Some of the questions led me to do things differently in the business. And I did that, that, that it happens pretty quickly. I mean, that, that whole process takes three or four weeks because the bankers are saying, Hey, you know, there's 12 of you guys. I hope you're already a pony up. You know, this guy wants, you know, what, what, whatever X, I mean, her job at that point, and in my case, I had a female lead banker, her, 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 his job is to get that price up and that 12 bankers to wherever it goes is a big part of that whole process. And went from, I mentioned August, September, October, went to 40, uh, October, November, went to 12. And by December 1st, we had two, we were down to two and somewhere um, kind of post Thanksgiving to December 11th, we, we chose the final um, private equity firm to sign with. It's a very formal process. We, we had to call the other guys who actually had a better relationship with the guy I said no to on that day than the guy who ended up trying to buy us. Yeah, yeah, I had to call the guy and say, hey, really sorry, like we're not selling to you. Um, you just spent you know, all this time trying to, woo, trying to woo us, trying to like buy us and we're not gonna sell to you. And then you start a, you start a, a due diligence process, which is a whole other Kind of a, well, what was the, how would you compare what were the key differences between the two offers you know the, the banker's big job at the end is just getting as much cash as possible there were some substantial differences in the offers related to leverage you know one had three times money borrowed one had two times money borrowed why do you care uh both the deals involved myself staying on in some capacity either buying back 10 percent or buying back 15 percent or buying back five percent mm -hmm. So I was buying back some equity and the more levered the business is, the less, the less valuable the equity is. So as you think about it, if, if they're making you buy back 15%, which is very common in private equity, but they lever the business up, uh, you just run the risk of them you know, taking your equity because the business is still levered up. So it matters um, on that level of, of the quality of the offer. But at the end of the day, um, yeah, you know, I think the final two bidders, there was four or five million dollars or maybe three or four million dollars of increase from the day this bidding war started on November 15th, the time it closed on December 11th. There was, you know, there, there were multiple folks giving really complex offers. I mean, these are, the law firms must love these things because each offer must take, you know, four or five associates and it's the whole day and they send it out at 7 p.m. And, and then we get it and we spend the whole day responding to it. Um, that they're very comprehensive offers. And if you have, I think we, had, we, we ended up with three, we ended up with multiple people doing it. So you have, you have a lot of legal work taking place in which I'm not a legal by Trump. I'm, I'm a sales and marketing guy. So I needed people to explain that to me. It was just, a, it was, I just get spending time on that, that part of it and, and having, um, you know, my case, I, you know, my mom's a lawyer, which, you know, my sister, I have some legal background, but having some legal people to, Having a strong legal team is a big part of the sales process. And lawyers you trust because you're going to spend more time with them than with your your spouse if you have one or, or, or your employee that they become a 
a big part of the, the last few months of your sale process. What tipped the scales in favor of the, the PE firm that you ended up uh, signing the LOI with? What, why did you choose them? Uh, on, the, on the private, uh, on, on the investment banking side, I banker. No, no. You said you had two or three offers. There was some uh, substantial differences between the two, but eventually you chose one. I think at the end, it just kind of came. I think I probably got caught up in the whole process because at the end, you're talking about maybe, a, you know, maybe the difference is three hundred thousand dollars between offer A and offer B. But I think I got so caught up in kind of getting the most I could. Um, so if I look back at looking at those two bankers or those two, so the, 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 it was both private equity. It was a private equity firm based in New York City, a private equity firm based in Chicago. So I was dealing with two different cities and two different buyers. And um, looking back, I probably would have chosen the one I turned down for 300 grand difference. But at the time, I think I was so caught up in the bidding process over, you know, there's more money here. It's more this, more that. Uh, what, that was what, happened? Factor. what happened next? So in our case, December 11th, uh, is when we sign the LOI. They, they want to close as close to February 1st as they can. So they're saying, hey, we're going to get this whole thing done. Seven, eight weeks, we're going to close. We're going to be a big, big check. We become our star employee. We're going to, you know, do all these cool things together, have a Florida presence. And our, you know, our chairman, who's this trillionaire with airplanes, has a place down there. And we're going to have this really amazing life together. And, and that, that it, it's this, you know, process. But what due deals with me on their side is, they, we said we're going to pay you 25 million, but after due diligence, we're going to pay you 21.2 and then make you do something. It, it's just a process to, to, to get less money from the seller, which, which costs a lot of legal costs. It costs a lot of finance, a lot of accounting costs. And uh, in our case, it really soured the deal. So uh, between December and March, uh, I pulled the deal in April. Um, you know, we, we all spent three months of legal, three months of all this time uh, to get the deal ready. We were ready. We, we have to the bank invite. At the end, the bank gets involved. They're like, oh, deal's done. Oh, the bank hasn't approved it yet. You're like, really? You haven't told us that. We thought you had the money. No, we're going to borrow the money. Uh, so there's always these things that are happening. We had, I had so much ill will towards the sellers. I'm sorry, towards the buyers. Um, ill will is the, is, is the wrong way to describe it. I, I had so much unease related to who they actually were because they, they, they seem to have very strong opinions on things that were immaterial to the business or success or, or, you know, they, they had things like, you know, Josh, we love you. And here's, here's what you'll make. And none of your staff can have any raises next 12 months. And I explained our company culture, like, well, that's a, that's a great idea. Our whole incentive system is based on sales and growth and they make money every month. It, it was, it was stuff like that. I'm like, okay, guys, whatever you want, give me a big check, whatever you want. But it was stuff like that, you know, along with things like working capital and working capital is an arcane term that anyone who sells crypto will learn all about. But you can fight about it for months and you can spend a lot of money on this notion. It was things like that really create a lot of, in my, in my own feeling, um, unease. And then on top of that, to your listeners, I had just gotten married and my wife was due with a baby uh, that summer. So while I was supposed to close in April, I was also going to be a dad for the first time. And my beautiful daughter, Olivia, was born in May of 2014. Um, it was also like, hey, you guys seem like you, you, you might be pricks. I don't really know. I don't really care. But I don't need the money that badly to, to risk it with this new baby coming. So I pulled the deal. Um, it was at the last minute. My banker said, he used the term like, leave him at the altar, uh, which which, you know, we all, um, we all walked away as gentlemen. It was very, you know, I talked to them personally. Everyone, you know, it was very, although we, we spent maybe a million dollars combined on legal. I mean, their legal costs were more than mine. And, and you know, mine was substantial. Uh, so leaving at the altar w w w was an expensive way to learn about the investment banking process. Uh, but it was the right decision for me because my daughter was born and I didn't have to travel much that year. And I got to spend time with her. And then... I have a happy ending because I ended up on July 1st, 2015. I had a sister company that was in our space peripherally who I knew their CEO. And during our sales process, he became my like mentor. He thought he thought he was my mentor and he was aware of the whole thing. And he was amazed at my kahunas to walk away from this deal because they were ready to buy us. And he ended up, you know, I, 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 I ended up doing a merger. That I basically said, hey, if you want to buy us, you know, we were worth 6.8 times EBITDA on, on July 1st, 2014. 
um, you can buy us for that on July 1st, 2015. We'll, we'll give a 10% discount because clearly that, 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 that number that I used or this multiple that I look at the legal cost, half a million dollars and everything else. It gave me this, it gave me the multiple, it gave me the number to a merger. The merger of equals, which I was able to buy out my father, my aunts, mother, key stakeholders. They got out of the business. I had a small, you know, small exit from that. So I took some cash out and then ended up owning 26% of Nuco. Uh, Nuco is still around. Nuco is based in the Midwest. Nuco, um, I think they've grown since, the, I mean, I'm not involved anymore, but they're, they're still a successful, uh, you know, company and the people who work for me for, in my case, a dozen plus years, many are still there. Um, so it, it's been a, um, you know, uh, I learned a lot from it. I, I'm kind of now still in the same industry. I'm still working in healthcare. I'm now, now I'm working in cancer and oncology. So now I'm working global cancer research and helping drug companies with clinical trials and with a you know, physician engagement and, and identification of who under uh, thought leadership and who understands, you know, who's treating what patients and, what, and what's working. Uh, so yeah, it, it's on good terms, and, and I, I, I'm happy for the I'm happy for the new owners who bought me out a couple of years later, and you know, happy. I mean, I have people who worked there for 20 plus years because I owned it for almost 15 years, and it, I sold it five years ago. Um, so it's nice to see that, that that whole longevity. That's amazing. Do you remember? Last question. Do you remember the straw that broke the camel's back when you finally picked up the phone and said, "I'm not doing this deal"? You know, I remember. I, I, I remember, um, I remember doing it. I, I was in the parking lot. Um, so I was in Prince, Princeton, New Jersey. So Princeton's a very, you know, beautiful town and, and, you know, very famous, uh, Posh. There. Uh, a lot of drug companies there as well. So uh, quite a few drug companies, I mean, I guess they were founded there because a lot of smart people doing good science or they moved there for access to talent, but there's a lot of talented, you know, I was right in Princeton. I was in the parking lot of, of a client. Um, it was March, April, uh, and it was really cold. It was really, it was like a snowstorm outside. I'm in the parking lot of my rental car, you know, some like Ford Focus or some like, you know, just classic, you know, compact car. And I just left a meeting with, with, with this client or maybe I was just walking in. I, I was, I was killing time either before or after a meeting. And I just called my lawyer and I was like, Hey, it's all off. Don't bill any more hours. It was first of just turn it off because it was an expensive. Every day was costing money. It was turn it all off. Um, and I'm done. And how do I wind this all down? And my banker, who was a, actually a friend as well, he was, it was a, a guy I knew for a long time, you know, really said, you know, as, as your friend, you know, not as your banker, I, I don't know, not as your lawyer, I'm sorry, lawyer, I'm talking my lawyer, um, Michael, as your lawyer, um, and as your friend, let me say something. I, I, I beg you not to pull this deal as your friend, because in my experience as a lawyer, I've had a lot of people who ended up selling their companies and almost none ever regret it. But I know I have people who didn't sell their companies and it was worth you know, seven times EBITDA, but two years later, it was worth nothing. You know, he, he was really, he was really, as a friend, as an older gentleman friend, in the words, the words, the why, it really stuck with me because it was like, shit, like now this all goes to hell. This guy kind of warned me, he's my buddy. Um, so that was my, uh, I talked to my lawyer, gave me the, the lawyer and the friend conversation. And I said, okay, still turn off the freaking engine. Uh, the, this, this thing's over. And I flew back to Florida, um, you know, to Fort Lauderdale or West Palm Beach airport and um, told my partners, but I mean, that was hard. I'd tell my business partner who, who, who wanted the money. I, mean, I had to tell people who also were incentivized to sell that we weren't selling. Um, and uh, yeah, so it was, it was a crazy, but yeah, as I said, I had a wife who was eight months pregnant. So it wasn't like, you know, I, I was literally having a baby a month later. So my focus quickly moved from, oh, this really um, expensive, but impressive system. I really enjoyed the, the learnings I got from you know, as I said, I met with eight or nine private equity firms. I learned so much from these. It was usually two guys per meeting, maybe three women and men. It was 25, 30 people I met who were all super bright, you know, like, you know, you know, people who really had worked their whole lives to work really hard and to be able to talk at very high levels about not just finance, but also strategy and operations. So that was a... But what happened in the car, the rental car in New Jersey? Like, what was it that made you make the decision to pull the deal? 
I'd say like, definitely. Was it an email? Was it was it definitely email? being cold and anxiety. It was definitely anxiety and the temperature. Um, and the anxiety. You're miserable. It could have been having a baby in a month. I don't know what the anxiety was. But it was like, okay, this is, it's just time to make this decision. Because I, I think I had been, I remember uh, that there was a dinner. So I live in Delaware Beach, Delaware Beach, Florida is full of people from Ontario. So a lot of people, I mean, it, it, Delaware Beach is a great little beach town. We had this dinner with the buyers and my wife came who was pregnant at the time and it was like 20 people. We had this dinner in December or January um, with the buyers. And it was, it was this big dinner. It was, it was kind of awkward. You could tell at the dinner something just wasn't right. So it wasn't like I'd spent three or four months thinking, should I pull the deal? So it was mostly just saying, hell, I'm, I'm sick of thinking about this. It doesn't feel right. You know, the, the, it's not the right decision. The money's not enough money. The, the, the benefits are enough benefits. And I don't trust, you know, the, the, these things like them not understanding that cutting off 60K of staff wages is in the best interest of anyone just made me uneasy. And after three and a half months of, of that, along with these, you know, you know, costs that kept going up legal and everything else, it was just time to, 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 to actually turn the corner and move in a new direction, which then put me actually in, you know, if you're listening to hair, I mean, that then put me in, um, you know, really, really tough 2014. So I worked my butt off the next seven months because you, I basically spent the last 15 months not selling but packaging the business for sale. Um, so, you know, it, it, was a, it was a tenuous 14 because we, we did not hit our goal. The goal, we, we, we hit it in 12 and 13, but 14, we were distracted and ended up being flat with not showing growth. So, um, you know, the, if you end up leaving someone at the altar, you end up not selling, um, everyone's experience, including myself, is you've taken your eyes off the business and you will dip 10% or 20% or, Hopefully not more than that. It could be 50, 60 percent, but but that that that's a big. I, I I was warned about it, but I did not realize until that summer when my when I just became a father about how much we were behind because we weren't focused on growth. So, um, good stuff. Well, hopefully I, I can save another question or. No, I think you've been very generous with your time. I know we're over time, so we, we should break. Josh, this was amazing. Uh, do you want to point people to a website, uh, the new business, the oncology research, sure. or what? Our, 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 the, the, the new domain is uh, mdoutlook.com. mdoutlook.com. Mdoutlook. It's kind of like Microsoft Outlook, but MD in front, MD Outlook. And we also have a we call it oncology intelligence. So uh, uh, oncology intelligence or cancer intelligence is our main thought leader portal. So if, if you're a researcher in Germany or in Stanford and trying to learn more about melanoma or, you know, any sort of cancer, th th this is a up to date 24 seven curated uh, peer, peer to peer community. So we're that's fantastic. And we'll put that in the show notes at built cell.com. Josh, this was great. Thank you so much. So much fun and be well. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry, Connect with John at Facebook.com slash Built to Sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. -L 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 Thanks for listening.